and welcome everyone to today's Southern Fire Exchange webinar. I hope you can hear me. If anyone's having troubles with the audio, please uh, send me a message in the chat pod. My name is David Godwin, and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange. Today we're very excited to have our guest speaker, South Florida ecologist Dr. Mike Duver. Today Dr. Duver will be giving a presentation entitled Fire Disturbance and Successional Dynamics in Major South Florida Plant Communities. Before we start, if you haven't yet, please see the chat pod on the right side of your screen, lower right hand box. In that pod you could submit questions for the speaker. Uh, questions or comments for me or questions for other members of the audience. So while we wait just a couple of minutes for everyone to assemble, uh, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat pod uh, and let us know where you're located today and what organization you're associated with. For everyone participating during the live presentation today, we'll have a question and answer period following the presentation. We do ask that you hold those questions for the speaker until the end. And at that time, go ahead and type your questions into the chat pod. And finally, uh, if you need to leave the webinar early today, or if you know others who weren't able to make it, uh, the webinar is being recorded live, and it will be archived for free viewing on our, our Southern Fire Exchange YouTube page in just about a week. Uh, so we'll have that link on the Southern Fire Exchange website, too. So I'd like to take this opportunity to share a little bit of information about the Southern Fire Exchange. Southern Fire Exchange is a regional program for fire science delivery in the southeast, uh, funded by the Joint Fire Science Program. Our mission is to increase the availability and application of fire science information for natural resource management and to serve as a conduit for fire managers to share new research needs with the research community. So the best way to stay connected with us at the Fire Exchange is by joining our email list or by following one of our social media channels. Uh, to find links to all of those, see our website at www.southernfireexchange.org. And now on to our presentation. Now, Dr. Duver is a legendary South Florida ecologist with a truly impressive background. He has a Bachelor of Science in Zoology from the University of Illinois, Master of Science in Zoology, uh, and a Doctorate in Forest Resources from the University of Georgia. He has over 20 years experience working for the Audubon Society at the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, more than six years at the TNC Disney Wilderness Preserve, and then another yet 11 years with the South Florida Water Management District. He's quite the regional expert, and today he'll be talking about some of the research that he and his colleagues recently published in the Fire Ecology Special Wetlands issue. So uh, please join me and welcome Dr. Duver. Hello. Uh, I would like to talk to you today about something that's sort of the current status of something I've been working on for oh probably 40 years at this point and uh, kind of I'd like to get it put it out there and uh, kind of get feedback from people and say where they think it's wrong and and any suggestions they had for improving the information that we've got uh, in the models that we've been developing. Okay, the objective of this uh, presentation is to talk about two models uh, that we've been developing. As I say, this is, these are sort of versions of things that have been uh, in different stages over on the order of 40 years or so. Uh, the first is a plant community succession model for South Florida. And the main point of that is to try and describe how plant communities change over time in the absence of disturbance. And the second group of models are fire transition models. And what we're trying to do with those is to describe how plant communities change in response to different frequencies and severity of fire. Okay, we use these models to try and help us organize available information to understand how plant communities are influenced by major natural processes. There's an awful lot of information out there and just trying to find a way that we can sort of fit it all together uh, to look at kind of the whole system in South Florida. Uh, can be very, very difficult and complicated, and this is a way to try and simplify it uh, down to a point where it's a bit easier to grasp and build on for other kinds of things that people are, are working on. 
Um, by natural processes, I ta I'm talking mostly about hydrologic regimes, fire regimes. I'm talking about substrate characteristics that are frequently a product of hydrologic and fire regimes, and also site history, uh, which can make a lot of differences to what kinds of plant communities are out there based on kind of what's happened to them uh, before. Uh, the main mechanism, the methods that we tried to use uh, in developing these models is to capture knowledge of land managers and other SS experts. While quantitative information on structural characteristics and species composition is available for many natural plant communities, it's amazing how little information there is on directions and rates of change from one type of natural plant community to another. And I'm very much emphasizing the idea of natural plant communities here because one can go out right now and measure uh, hydrology, fire, plant communities in a lot of areas, uh, but a lot of these areas have been very strongly influenced by man's activities, and they really don't qualify as good examples of sort of the way these communities would operate and function uh, when they're being completely controlled by natural processes. So that's a very important part of the points that we're trying to discuss here. Another thing is that in the 40 years I've been working uh, with land managers and others, uh, it's, it's become very clear to me that managers leave at some point. And all too often, a lot of the knowledge and experience that they've accumulated over the time that they've been at a particular site or area uh, just is gone and is not available to new people coming into the area. And so being able to provide some form of information uh, that can help a new land manager uh, kind of better understand kind of what he's trying to manage uh, is a big goal of trying to develop these models. And another is to try and explain land management programs to others. Uh, when a land manager is talking to the budget people in the main office somewhere, uh, about uh, why he needs resources in order to be able to maintain the system the way he's been told to maintain it. Uh, to have something like this can be very helpful in, in sort of pursuing his argument because it does say something about what's going to happen if you don't do this, if you don't burn, or if you don't deal with a hydrologic problem or an imminent problem, hydrologic problem. And also uh, a big part of it too is that uh, maybe talking to your lawyers because they may need to understand why you feel so strongly that something that's happening on land adjacent to you shouldn't happen and the implications of what that kind of activity might have on the lands that you're trying to manage uh, can have. It, it's a way of sort of helping them understand uh, the importance of uh, maintaining these natural systems and what, what allows you to maintain them. Okay, this effort, this current effort uh, that I've been working on in the South Florida uh, models uh, was facilitated by the South Florida Interagency Fire Management Council. Uh, back in the early 2000s, they formed a subcommittee uh, of people within the council uh, to try and essentially brainstorm uh, these models and bring information that would be helpful in, in sort of making them more uh, quantitative, more effective. Eventually the team that we put together met about every two months for over about three years or so. And a key part of what we were trying to do was to have individuals bring their field experience uh, to on plant communities uh, and fire to the process. We did not want people to come and tell us what their agency thought should or shouldn't be done. We wanted to know what the land manager knew, had seen, uh, and believed about the way these systems work, and not just something that was a sort of an agency uh, statement about the way they should work. Okay, the area that we're talking about, South Florida, basically it's pretty much everything south of, uh, of Lake Okeechobee. An awful lot of the area is pretty heavily developed one way or another, but there are large expanses down in the Big Cypress, uh, Big Cypress Swamp, and down in the Everglades and the like that uh, are still fairly natural in a lot of ways and have the opportunity of being able to uh, manage them naturally. 
Uh, there are other areas out across the landscape, smaller areas that, that people are trying to manage as natural systems too, and hopefully uh, this will make their job a little bit easier to have this kind of information. Okay, the first model I'm going to start with is the plant community succession model for South Florida. Uh, what I'd like to do is tell you about the information sources that have gone into it, the model assumptions, show you the design of how the model design, and also say something about the application of these models. So, but before we actually even get into talking about the models, again, what I'm saying, what I said is that this is a model for major natural plant communities in South Florida. But first, we've got to get people to agree on what those communities are. And when you're modeling it, you can't really have uh, a very large sort of set of communities that you're working with. Some of the classifications out there have over 100 different communities in South Florida. And so it's got to be something that's reasonably manage, manageable. And, but some of the other criteria that we have were that communities must be naturally occurring. Uh, I'm sure all of us can think of lots of places that are not functioning naturally at this point and what they look like. Uh, most are detectable on aerial photography. Uh, we want the boundaries to be verifiable on the ground. You've got to be able to be walk from a pine woods into a wet prairie or uh, cypress forest into a hardwood hammock or something like that and know what you're looking at. Uh, and we want the plant communities to be explicitly related to natural processes. Again, hydrologic regimes, fire regimes, and processes associated with the substrates that are in these areas. So again, that greatly limits the sort of the number of plant communities that you can work with because so many of them, particularly when you break them up into very small um, groups uh, or very relatively small areas, uh, they, there's other things that are uh, influencing why they're there, particularly site history a lot of the time. So, um, so those are the criteria that we use in trying to select the plant communities that we're going to talk about. Okay, as far as developing the model, we wanted to quantify as much as we could the transitions that we're talking about in, in time. I talked about sort of we want to look at what rates are at which communities change. And so one of the ways of doing that is to look at uh, old and current photography. This is a photo of my backyard back in 1976. And while this looks like a, a wet prairie, it actually is a logged hydric pine flatwoods. And so again, using aerial photography to say, OK, what's this look like now? Uh, OK, this is 1976. This is 2009, picture taken from about the same point. And it's really much more sort of a mesic pine flatwoods at this point. This is 33 years after the last picture and 35 years after the last fire went through this area. So this is 35 years without fire. OK, tree ages is another kind of way of trying to get at rates. Um, this is essentially a cross section through your typical cypress dome, cypress strand, sort of halfway through it anyway. And at Corkscrew, basically, we went in and we wanted to understand the structure of this community. And so we wanted to understand, like, are the tree, big trees there bigger just because they're older or because maybe they're grow, growing on better sites? And so one way to get at that was to kind of look at size versus age. And when you essentially measure, uh, in this case, in this particular example, on the order of about 45 trees along the transect from the outside of the forest to the center of the forest, this is the relationship you see. There's a correlation of 0.916 between the age and the dBH of the trees out in this area. So age was a pretty, or dBH was a pretty good um, explanation of why um, of that age um, dBH relationship. Substrates is another parameter to look at because it can influence uh, the kinds of communities that are out there. And here you can see there's sand in a portion of the area. It doesn't really, isn't seen much under the cypress, limestone further down. And then you've got this organic soil uh, that underlies most of the cypress forest with it being fairly thin at the edge and fairly uh, thick at uh, where the big trees are. 
So that was an interesting kind of relationship. And if you actually plot the DBH, the largest cypress, and the peak depths at 30 meter intervals along the, the transect that we had uh, through this forest, uh, you get a correlation of about 0.953. So that's a pretty good correlation. There's a relationship there, obviously, between the organic soils and uh, the size of the trees that are there. OK, another possible uh, inf or mechanism for trying to understand the way rates uh, are changing or things that are influencing rates here. Again, looking at the same figure, the same transect, um, one of the things you can do with organic soils is you can core them. And you can go in, you can core them, and then you can carbon date uh, different portions of the core. So when we did that at a number of sites along this transect, basically uh, what we would see is down sort of in the deeper parts of it, right on the limestone, there were marl soils with snails in them that we were able to date at over 10,000 years. And if you look at the organic soils on top of that marl, uh, the sort of the earliest dates on those was about 5,000 years or so. And with the different cores that we had along this uh, peat mass, we were able to show that, at, say, up about this point or so, at a, this is like down around six feet or so, and this would be about four feet. And basically, the peat mass just sort of was there back uh, about 3,000 years ago or so. And then if you look at it about two, two feet, uh, essentially the peat mass was about there. And so we were able to say something about sort of the accumulation of the, this organic soil mass at corkscrew. And one other thing that was interesting was that in the bottom of some what we call lettuce lakes, some of the ponds in, uh, at corkscrew, you could find an ash layer underneath uh, these ponds that indicated that essentially they were created by fires, peat fires. And if you carbon dated the organics that had accumulated on top of that ash, they dated at about uh, 540 years before present. And it was interesting that the oldest trees that we found at Corkscrew were on the order of about, 5, 000, about 500 years also. And so this would suggest that six, seven, eight hundred years ago or something, a major fire came through there and essentially pretty much eliminated that forest and created these lakes that we're seeing there. Maybe another smaller kind of indication, this is that area I showed you earlier uh, that looks like a, a, a wet prairie. But if you, and I've, there's other places that I've seen in central Florida where uh, they're were considered to be dry prairie, but if you wander around some of these areas, you find these depressions out there. And if you check out those depressions, you can actually see the pine roots that are sticking up uh, out of the ground where the stumpers had come in after the area had been logged and removed the stumps for turpentine. And so little things like that can help you say, OK, this actually is hydropine flatwoods. It is not a wet prairie. Uh, and then. I mean, there's a lot of other things over the years that we've tried to use as sort of to give us information on sort of how things are changing and at what rates. Uh, so as expressed sort of in field experience of the authors and others. Uh, but what it comes down to in the end is that there's always holes in what you know. And so what you need to do is just, again, have with people with good, a lot of or experience, uh, have them essentially use their best professional judgment to kind of fill in the holes. It isn't necessarily sort of an absolute statement about what is, but it's our best guess, and maybe it'll give us some guidance on how to uh, look for information to either prove or disprove it. So based on a lot of this information, we developed a plant community matrix for South Florida along with the characteristics of these plant communities. And I'd like to just give you a few examples of sort of some of the communities and how they compared uh, in terms of the vegetation and their different uh, physical characteristics. So like Music Pine Flatwoods is primarily, well, both of the flatwoods have a canopy dominated by slash pine, whereas the music flatwoods are, have a dense saw palmetto ground cover, and the hydric pine flatwoods has a diverse, primarily herbaceous ground cover. And then if you look at the physical characteristics, and basically, if you look at the topographic settings and soils, there's very little difference uh, between these two communities. If you look at the fire regime, there's a very, very little difference between these. 
But if you look at the hydrology, you'll see that the mesic flatwoods are somewhat drier than the hydric flatwoods are. And the water table is further below ground during the wet season and also has a greater fluctuation than the hydric flatwoods. And so hydrology is the main feature by which you distinguish uh, these communities. And just to give you the physical example of them, this is mesic flatwoods. Again, you can see a very dense saw palmetto ground cover in there. And this would be the hydric flatwoods. You can still see palmetto, but it's mostly an herbaceous community. And actually, in the mesic flatwoods, if all the saw, saw palmetto wasn't so tall, you'd be able to see these sort of fingers of this grassy hydric flatwoods sort of fingering in amongst the, the mesic flatwoods too, but not dominating it. Another group comparison that we can do, maybe more dramatic, is freshwater marsh versus a mixed cypress hardwood swamp. Uh, the marsh has got a tall, dense, herbaceous community, whereas the um, swamp has got a closed canopy of large cypress and mixed hardwoods. The hydrology on these groups are not that different. The setting that they're in, topographically, and the types of soils are both on organic soils, but isn't that different. But the fire regime is completely different in these. And so that's the main factor that really sorts out these communities. And this is the freshwater marsh at Corkscrew. This actually is on about six feet of organic soil here. And uh, sort of a not very diverse community of, um, but, uh, of herbaceous vegetation primarily. And this is sort of the mixed cypress hardwood swamp. And the main difference in these communities is not soil, is not the setting that it's in, it's the fire regime. Okay, if you do the, that kind of sorting for all the different plant communities that we've settled on uh, as being representatives of major communities, this is the classification we come up with. And basically what we've done is sort them on fire interval, how often fire occurs, and hydrology. And for the wetland communities, the hydro period, or how many days per year they're inundated, have water above the ground surface or for upland communities, the wet season water table depth. And basically the different uh, communities sort out on this basis. And I'll talk about, next talk about sort of how they sort out. And there are certain combinations of fire and hydrology where there are no, no plant communities. It's just too wet for fire to occur there with any kind of significance at all. The other is essentially herbaceous wetlands. And this actually is supposed to be no fire. And basically over time, they go to a shrub community and then finally to a woody wetland. Okay, in your upland communities, you have a fire tolerant woody community, the pines. Uh, and again, no fire goes into a shrubby community and then finally into a fire tolerant uh, hardwood community. Okay, if you look at drainage, if the site gets drier, essentially any of these kinds of transitions can occur. You, the place gets drier, the, the organic soils oxidize in the freshwater marsh and gradually it turns into a wet prairie. Or if a wet prairie gets drier, pines start to invade the area and, uh, and essentially the, you see your transitions going in this direction. If you actually get drainage and increase fire, uh, basically what you've got is your communities that are like Cyprus essentially will go to sort of pine communities over time uh, because of the increased fire and the drier conditions that exist. So that's a way that we would use these models to try and say, okay, uh, if something's happening to us that's going to change the hydrology or the fire interval, uh, what kinds of changes would we expect to see in the system? So could we predict eventually? It might not happen right, right away, but it's more very likely that over the long run you're going to see those kinds of changes. And another is lakes and ponds and streams that basically with the accumulation of organic uh, soils, you actually can go into mangrove systems and along the coast or floodplain swamp mix or mixed cypress hardwood swamps uh, as they become shallow enough for woody vegetation to invade them. An important part of understanding uh, 
sort of these transitions is, at least in the model, what we're talking about is the maximum rate of succession. Basically, seed sources were always available and conditions were always suitable for germination and seedling survival. Succession can always go more slowly if seed sources are farther away or if conditions aren't right when those seed sources do arrive for the germination and survival of the seedlings. So what we're trying to do is say what the minimum amount of time is in this model. And the other thing is that we're looking at the long-term pr perspective. Um, in all of these communities that uh, I've shown you in the model, uh, exist in a range from drought conditions to flood conditions and with the two extremes not happening very often and a lot of the intermediate uh, range occurring much, much more frequently. But all of those extremes can occur at least occasionally. So in order to understand the existence of these communities and the maintenance is you've got to think long term uh, that it takes fire regime, repeat, a repeated fire regime in order to maintain them, uh, repeated hydrologic conditions uh, within a certain range in order to maintain them. So, okay, as far as trying, what are we going to do with these models? And basically, I like to think of them as being a generalization of our understanding of how major environmental factors determine characteristics and distribution of major plant communities. While the model is specific to South Florida, it can be readily modified uh, for other areas. As I said, we've been wor I've been working on this stuff for 40 years now or so. And the first model that I developed was back in 1976. It looked a lot like this, but uh, it had characteristics that were specific to Corkscrew Swamp. And I based this initial model on work that Taylor Alexander had published in 1971, where he showed uh, sort of the transitions between major plant communities in South Florida. But Taylor hadn't really talked about sort of the rates at which those transitions occurred. And so that's kind of what we've been trying to focus on uh, on a lot of these models that you see uh, in this figure right here. And so again, 76, we did Corkscrew Swamp, which is about 10,000 acres, and Big Cypress Swamp in 84, which is about a million acres, uh, Kissimmee River Floodplain in 93, Disney Wilderness Preserve in 1999, uh, which is again about 10,000 acres or so in South Florida, which again is millions of acres. The point being is these models can, rather than starting from scratch when you're trying to put something like this together, with starting with something that's already there and tweaking it, modifying it to your uh, particular purposes, increasing the detail, decreasing the detail, uh, can save a lot of time and bring you along a lot faster to trying to sort of understand uh, these kinds of systems. So while there are other factors influencing plant community in South Florida, it's really important to understand that hydrology and fire are the two most important and the two by which humans can most significantly affect them. And that's a particularly important aspect is the fact that those are also the most impactable by eliminating fire or having too many fires or too severe fires at the wrong time uh, or draining a place or flooding a place or whatever. Uh, we've done a lot of that in South Florida. And it's important to think too about whether we're talking, we're not just talking about on-site management but also off-site. I mean we want to use this kind of information to better manage our particular properties. Um, but also to make us aware of what the implications are of things that are happening around us that could affect uh, the hydrology fire regimes uh, on our property. Okay, that's the succession model. Uh, I'd like next to talk about fire transition models, and there's two of them just because of the size of the model that we developed. And the point of this, again, is, is to document plant community changes associated with fire. We've just talked about uh, essentially moving to later successional stages. Uh, another way of looking at it is, OK, what kind of fire regime do we need in order to maintain the existing community that we have? And then finally, if, if we don't have uh, the fire regime that we want. We want an earlier successional stage, which happens a lot of times when there just isn't enough fire in a system. Uh, what's our best guess as to what it'll take to return us to that earlier successional stage just using fire? 
Okay, we're going to talk about sort of the fire regime parameters uh, that we used in this model. And all of this is based on the consensus of field experience of prescribed burners on, again, the fire count, South, South Florida Fire Council members that were involved in kind of developing these models. And so the first thing that the first parameter is a fairly obvious one, how often does it burn? The range of the fire intervals. The second one is whether it's growing or dormant season when, when a burn occurs. There's sort of different thoughts about how important this is, but in some cases it seems like it, whether you burn in the growing season or the dormant season does have some influence on uh, the kinds of communities that you'll get over the long run. And then fire intensity, how severe are the fires? And this was based on sort of flame lengths and whether they're low, moderate, high, very high. And flame lengths are a function of available fuels and weather conditions. Just, and available fuels are a big part of that is just, again, how long it's been since it's burned, how much accumulation there's been over time on it. And weather conditions are, can make a lot of difference, how windy it is, what the humidity is, temperature, and various other facts, factors can make a very big difference in what kind of a fire you're going to get. And finally, one kind of fire that a lot of people don't like to think about is a single severe fire, which I've defined as it consumes a sufficient amount of organic soil to kill most vegetation rooted in the soil. So this is the kind of fire that can very quickly uh, change uh, the kinds of communities that are in area. So, because it, it li completely eliminates resprouting of uh, the extant vegetation there. And I have to mention something about human non fire alteration, uh, mechanical, chemical treatment. And in some cases, it just isn't possible, at least initially, to be able to go in and burn, do the kinds of natural burns that you really no need to be done in an area. Sometimes the vegetation's too tall and too dense and it needs to be knocked down or otherwise the fire will just be more intense than is possible on the site that you're located on, particularly if there's much in the way of development around you. Uh, sometimes there isn't sufficient fuel to carry a fire and you've got to knock down uh, what is there and let it dry out so that you actually do have enough fire to carry, uh, fuel to carry a fire through the area. And other times you just can't get a burn permit. Uh, a lot of times that's associated with smoke hazards and major roads or urban areas where there's hospitals or nursing homes or things like that in the vicinity where there are people that uh, can be very easily affected by smoke. So those are conditions under which mechanical, chemical treatment might be appropriate. Okay, I want to get into the models now. And what I want to do is first to introduce you to sort of the, just the lay of the land of these models. Uh, I've got two kinds of models, one on organic soils and one on mineral soils. But each of them has this basic format where you have, like in this case, two plant communities, a freshwater coastal marsh community, and a shrub wetland. And what we want to talk about is, okay, what kinds of conditions will maintain that community? What kind of fire frequency? What's the intensity of the fire and whether it's growing or dormant season? And what kinds of conditions will allow that community to transition to a later successional community uh, with lack of fire for a period of time, maybe low intensity fires during the dormant season, and finally, what kinds of fires it would take to be able to bring the shrub wetland back to a freshwater coastal marsh. Almost invariably, getting it back to what it was from a later successional stage requires much more fire than just maintaining it. And that's a very important characteristic. Just sort of burning in the way it should naturally burn won't get you there if you've gone uh, down the successional line. OK, looking at the whole fire transition model for organic soils, I've kind of broken it up into a few pieces to make it a little bit easier to follow. And again, the transitions that we just talked about, the freshwater marsh and shrub wetland. OK, from the shrub wetland, basically, uh, with a less frequent fire, you can get cypress mangrove swamp. With no fire, it goes to a mixed cypress hardwood swamp or a floodplain swamp or mangrove swamp, depending on sort of the location uh, that you're in. And again, each of these has its own sort of fire maintenance frequency. And uh, 
and then this community actually with no fire uh, would go down to the mixed cypress and we do have routes that show that you can go back to a shrub wetland uh, but typically if you're going to do that again the est is a severe fire it's a muck fire you really need to get rid of pretty much all the vegetation in there so it just doesn't re-sprout and it comes back into a shrub wetland and again most people very few people plan on having a muck fire and so this isn't something that you can do with prescribed burning or the like and in some cases you may need to do mechanical chemical clearing or treatment if you really want to make this transition back to a shrub wetland for one reason or another so okay examples of what I just told you about okay this is the freshwater marsh 1975 this is functionally that same marsh 15 years later. That's all willow that has come in in 15 years without fire. Okay, that first picture was 1975. So that's 36 years ago. And this is 2011. This is that same marsh. Actually, the willow died back, but it's all coming back from sprouts. Uh, I don't know why I died, it just did, but it is coming back, it hasn't gone away. And 36 years later, we're seeing the cypress come in, we're seeing maples come in, we're seeing other hardwoods coming in. So this community in 36 years has gone from a strictly herbaceous community uh, to something that is pr primarily a shrub community with invading cypress and hardwoods coming in. And eventually, we'll go to this condition, uh, given enough time. Unfortunately, the next slide shows essentially that same cypress mixed hardwood community after a fire has gone through it. Uh, this is one of those, a stump from one of those big old cypress you saw in the last picture. There's been organic soil loss in here. It's been enough to create open water in some areas. In some areas, it's just it's a marsh community, early succession, or willows coming in uh, in certain places. So. This is essentially 15 years after that cypress forest has burned and what it looks like. Okay, one other uh, example of organic soils is essentially you've got a, a lake pond going to a freshwater coastal marsh with organic accumulation. So that's sort of the last transition that we'll talk about on organic soils. And that's an example we've got here. This is one of what they call lettuce lakes. Uh, this is Pistia stratoides, I believe, uh, water lettuce that's sitting on the ground uh, at Corkscrew Swamp on the mud. Uh, so during the wet season, water depths in here are on the order of 1.5 to 2 meters. And this is one of the places where there's an ash layer uh, with an overlaying accumulated organics layer uh, that was C14 dated at about 540 years or so. So, so this is sort of an example of one of these sort of ponds that was, was created by a peat fire that actually is considered one of the more attractive places, at least during the wet season, uh, by most people at Corkscrew Swamp. But one of the things that happens when these um, ponds dry out is that essentially you get what we call floating tussocks. Essentially you get uh, gas or uh, oxygen or air or something that actually is in these dried out surface layers of the organic soils. And when water levels come up, particularly if they come in fast, uh, these tend to break loose and pop up, maybe with the help of gators or turtles or something. But they tend to float, pop up and they'll float downstream to sort of the downstream end of these lakes. And over time, because they're floating, they may be on two or three feet, four feet of water, but they're floating at the surface and they get colonized by vegetation, including in this case, pond apples. And so um, basically what you've got are trees growing on these tussocks. And over time, they get big enough and are able, at least some of the vegetation growing on them can uh, root in the ground and essentially reestablish uh, a forest in these areas in the bottom ends of these or lower ends of these uh, uh, lettuce lakes that we saw. So this is sort of an example of organic accumulation. Okay, looking at some of the mineral soils. Uh, the driest, highest and driest sites basically are coastal strands that you see along the, uh, the coast of Florida and behind the beaches and that and scrub communities that are sort of sandy ridges in the interior. 
of uh, Florida. And both of them, in the absence of fire, will go to Zurich Hammock. And again, we can see you need very severe fires in order to be able to reestablish these communities. One of the things about uh, the scrub, and for sure, and, uh, is that they essentially have sort of stand uh, reducing uh, fires on them. And this fire tends to be very, very severe and uh, essentially eliminates uh, the forest that is there and allows it to go back to an earlier successional stage. So in some cases, again, uh, you may have to have mechanical chemical clearing in order to really uh, be able to reestablish uh, some of these communities. Okay, an example of a scrub, rosemary shrubs, sand pine out here in places. Some can't see them real well, but some scrub oaks uh, that have come into the area, they tend to be very open, sandy areas uh, with a sort of a very open uh, ground cover. Given enough time in the absence of fire, this is what they'll look like. Essentially, those oaks get bigger and bigger, kind of grow together, and essentially form a more or less complete canopy that shades out most of the, the lower uh, the ground cover uh, that's in the area. So, however, with a, again, like I say, these uh, places tend to burn very, very hot and very, very severely. And this is one of those hammocks about a year after a very in high intensity fire that's gone through. It's starting the, the shrub or the oaks are starting to sprout around the bases in this area, but if, if enough fires are put into this area over time, uh, it's very likely that uh, essentially the scrub community could be reestablished uh, in this area. Okay, sort of inter going down the hydrologic gradient, going into the pine communities, we've talked about sort of going from the pine flatwoods to the shrubby pine flatwoods to the hydric hammock kind of thing, and again, uh, sort of the different rates at which uh, the different transitions would occur. Uh, hydric flatwoods, an example of that. Hydric flatwoods, again, 15 years or so without fire. This is mostly wax myrtle. And uh, it very much did uh, look like that 15 years after fire had occurred in this site. And given enough time, probably a very long time in this particular case, uh, it would turn into a hydric hammock. Uh, and we do have some of these uh, at corkscrew or so that kind of illustrate uh, that transition. Okay, the sort of the, the lowest part of the uh, hydrologic gradient, uh, we've got essentially wet prairies, coastal marsh. Essentially, these are herbaceous communities on mineral soils. Uh, again, with the absence of fire, they can turn, move toward being a shrub wetland, at which point, depending on where they are on the gradient, uh, sort of the drier end of it, or the, you get more of a pine community coming in and occupying the site, or the wetter end, a cypress community will come in uh, over time and eventually take over uh, the site. And again, given enough time, actually uh, a mixed cypress hardwood forest can become established there. And this is kind of a nice example of that. This, this is a wet prairie that existed exists at Corkscrew Swamp. When I got there in 1975, this was all wax myrtle, this whole area in here. Uh, basically, you've got a gradient of about 1.5 feet from this point along the edge of the pineland down to the edge of the cypress or so. And uh, when Audubon got this property, basically uh, they eliminated fire from the wetlands because the people didn't understand the importance of it. Wax myrtle moved in, and we finally figured out the problem in the mid-70s or so. They went in with a tractor tire, or a rubber tire tractor and essentially eliminated all the wax myrtle and other trees, including cypress that were coming in and pines that were coming in. And since about late 1970s or so, this area has been burned every few years and the wet prairie has been completely restored in this area. So again, uh, the models that we're producing are basically a generalization of our understanding of how, how fire management can determine the characteristics and distribution of major plant communities in an area. And again, the model is specific to South Florida that can be readily adapted to other areas. Uh, the models that I've been showing you for the fire transitions basically were 
originated on some work that we did on Avon Park Air Force Range with the Nature Conservancy and then were adapted for Disney Wilderness Preserve uh, in 1999. So it gives you a nice base to start from when you're trying to figure out okay how these systems fit together and what the major processes are that are driving them. And basically I like to look on the models as our hypothesis about how an area will or will not change and how fast those changes are likely to occur as a result of fire management actions or inaction. And it's easy to talk about fire management actions, but all too often people don't talk about uh, not managing an area and just letting it go, uh, which can create a whole set of very severe and difficult to deal with problems. So. I think these models can be continually improved based on experience and data gained from future land management activities as well as research on, on these landscapes. And I think, but I think it's in, been incredibly important uh, to develop this mechanism for capturing the knowledge of people that have spent a lot of time on the land, seen a lot, know a lot about sort of good examples of why things happened or didn't happen, why they worked or didn't work, uh, so that it can be passed on to new land managers or be used to explain a land management program to others, again, such as your budget people or lawyers or whatever, wherever you're trying to develop support uh, for the programs that you're carrying on to, to manage the, your lands to the best of your ability. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Duver. That was a that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, once again, if y'all in the audience joined us during the presentation, my name is David Godwin. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange, and we just had a great presentation by South Florida ecologist Dr. Mike Duver. At this point in our webinar today, uh, we'd like to take the time left in our hour to try and address uh, some audience questions. Uh, so as the, the host, I'll attempt to moderate the questions that are entered into the chat pod. Uh, so if any of you all out there have questions, uh, please type them in to the chat pod. Uh, and uh, we'll give Dr. Huber an opportunity to address this. So I see we have, um, we have a number of folks that are starting to type things in. Uh, so as they get those in, uh, oh, it looks like Jane already has one right away, so I'll, I'll read it off here. This is from uh, Jane Smith. She says, sorry, but I have some interwo interwoven questions. She says, which plant community transitions are most vulnerable to invasive plants? Uh, vulnerable enough to preclude burning or require mechanical or chemical treatments? And are, are some of the non-action alternatives more vulnerable to invasives uh, than potential actions? Uh, actually, uh, kind of what I've presented today is the tip of a large iceberg. As I said, we've been kind of working on this for about 40 years or so. And some of the interesting things about exotics on this are that um, the next step uh, that the Fire Management Council uh, got into was trying to look at the major exotics in South Florida and see how they would tie into the succession model. And the idea being is that you don't necessarily want to go in and burn some areas if you've got some exotics that will really love the fire. That you might, you, in those situations, you really need to go in and deal with the exotics uh, before you actually go in and and put fire into the system. So that's one example of sort of thinking about exotics uh, out there. Another is um, that last slide I showed of uh, at Corkscrew, that big wet prairie, one of the interesting things about uh, the wet prairie environment is that it's too, it's too wet for pines and it's too fire, uh, there's too much fire in it for cypress. And so that's one of the reasons why the wet prairie exists where it does. And unfortunately, it's one of the optimal habitats for Malaluca. And so Malaluca can come into those areas very, very easily. And uh, so, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, 
so that's sort of an example of, um, I mean, fire really uh, wouldn't be, oh, that'd be a factor, really, of sort of getting rid of the Maluka before uh, uh, you do go in and burn. Uh, so, yes, you do have to take uh, into consideration when there are exotics in the area and how they will tie into this. And we do have additional information on essentially every one of the uh, FLIPC uh, Category 1 and Category 2 exotics that are in South Florida and how they fit into these succession models. Uh, if, some, if you wanted to contact me and I could send you that information. It would be a starting point anyway. All right, I, I see uh, another question that came in uh, from Craig Iverson, and he asked, are you aware of any similar models for the longleaf pine, wire grass, uh, blue stem communities in the, up in the coastal plain region, so outside of South Florida? Um, actually, the Disney Wilderness Preserve and the Avon Park uh, bombing range, bombing range, Air Force range, uh, were models uh, where uh, longleaf pine and wiregrass are included in the model. So those models actually do uh, cover that plant commuting. And again, I could send you that information if you wanted. Uh, we tried to publish that, mo that uh, paper at one point and it just didn't get published, but I still have the manuscript if anybody was interested. Okay. I see Craig has a follow-up there. I, I have a question. Um, one of the, the, the models seem like they're fairly comprehensive in, in terms of uh, describing the relationships amongst the successional pathways within these various communities. But uh, do you have a sense of, uh, of your confidence between those relationships? Do they vary within the models? Are there some successional pathways? Are there some communities that you, that you feel a little less confident about those relationships that are described in the model than others? And which ones do you, do you see as um, more of a questionable area or areas for, for future research? In the well, probably the easiest way to talk about that is that there's lots more examples of sort of early successional transitions uh, just because mm -hmm. you can see them out there on the ground even in 40 years or so. Mm -hmm. It's when you start getting out beyond 20, 30, 40, 50 years or so uh, those become sort of more uh, indirect estimates of uh, the rates at which these kinds of things happen. So that's probably the simplest way to answer that question. Another question coming here from uh, Michael Bush. Let's give him a minute there. And, uh, Michael says, where does the dry prairie fit into your models? Uh, dry prairie, one of the decisions we made as to where, uh, what plant communities were in South Florida, and it was not considered that dry prairie was a significant, um, it had any significant aerial extent in South Florida as we defined it. Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. I mean, we did, it is included in the uh, models for, again, the Avon Park Air Force Range and the Disney Preserve model. All right, looks like we have uh, a couple more folks that have some questions here. And in the next slide, for anyone interested, uh, we have a link. Uh, we'll show it in just a section. I'll go ahead and pull it up now. We have a link uh, at the top there. Uh, that goes directly to the um, publication that they just had in the fire ecology specialist. And that's an open access publication too, and so it's, it's free to download. So we have one, one more question here from Dean. Uh, it says, freshwater marsh regeneration after fire, uh, what is the effect of vegetation versus seed reproductive functions? Um. I guess most of the the places I've seen freshwater marsh regenerate is uh, is so when you don't have a muck fire that basically you get resprouting and a lot of times when you're on organic soils like that you don't get uh, muck fire particularly in a prescribed burn because it's usually that not that dry at those times uh, if you uh, 
uh, get a muck fire in an area, uh, then probably, the, if not much muck is lost, potentially the uh, the vegetation you would get some resprouting, uh, but seed seed introduction would be more important. Makes a lot of difference whether it's a muck fire or not. Looks like we have one more from Michael. And I had a, just one more thing. I was just curious to see, do you feel like this this new and improved model is, is being um, adapted by the uh, management agencies in the South Florida area? Is, is are, Have they seen it? Do they know about it? And is it... Do you, do you feel like this, well, is, this is being implemented? Well, the publication just came out on, in April, so at this point, uh, it's not really had a lot of exposure. So, okay. hard to say at this point. Yeah. Uh, looks like we have one more from uh, NRC. Michael says NRCS is currently working on ecological site descriptions, and these models are great reference materials for our work. So there it is. It sounds like uh, there's an example of. Uh, of this work being uh, implemented in a management way. So that's outstanding. Okay, well, it, it looks like we've uh, come up towards the end of our time for the day. And, and uh, thank you for the great questions from the folks in the audience. I uh, would like to definitely thank our guest, Dr. Mike Duver, for his uh, fantastic presentation today and, and, and for sharing his work and his recent publication and all the work that went into these models. Uh, thanks, everyone else in the audience uh, who joined us, and we hope that this webinar will be useful in your uh, fire management and fire research programs. Uh, there's a link right there on the middle of the screen. Uh, it says for webinar feedback, and if you have the opportunity to ask you, please click on that link uh, and take a couple minutes to fill out a questionnaire, and that will help us to figure out how to tailor our future webinars uh, to better suit your fire science needs. Uh, we really do pay attention to the feedback that comes in from those surveys. Uh, today's webinar was recorded, uh, as we mentioned earlier, and it will be archived for later free viewing on the Southern Fire Exchange YouTube page. Uh, we'll have links to that at www.southernfireexchange.org. So once again, uh, thanks to everyone who participated today. Uh, if you'd like to hear about our, our future webinars and programming, uh, please join our email list. Uh, and check out our Facebook and Twitter pages as well. Uh, so finally, thanks again, everyone, and thank you very much, Dr. Duver, and have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.